Hi, everyone. I'm David Toll. I'm the host of the program. I'm the uh, publisher of Private Equity Career News. Uh, you joined us a little bit early, so um, we're not going to get started for another four or five minutes, but I wanted to, uh, to welcome you and reward you for, uh, for joining us so soon. Um, you can uh, immediately download a copy of the uh, presentation from today's program. Just go to the handout section of your control panel. Uh, you'll also find a uh, PowerPoint presentation with the results of a survey that I did last year of uh, business development uh, practices in private equity. Lots of good uh, data and insights in there. So please avail yourself of, uh, of that. I'm uh, super excited. Uh, we've got a great slate of speakers for you today. And um, I thought it might be nice just to go around real quick before we get started and hear, uh, hear a weather report. We, uh, we basically cover the East Coast from north to south. And then uh, uh, if you can sort of picture a backwards L, we also cover the, uh, the mid, uh, the southwest. So why don't we start um, at the top of the backwards L, uh, Nadim, up in uh, the New York City area. What's what's the weather like today, Nadim? <laughs> and Nadim, we can't hear you. <laughs> we got a hot hot front and more of a hot front coming in here in the summer in the greater New York area. So it's not as bad as it's been for the last few uh, few weeks which has been 90s and feels more like 100 with the humidity in the city. But uh, it's about approaching 80 degrees um, and sunny, a little, a little a shower forecast later in the afternoon, but not too bad here in, here in New York. Okay, and um, we're going we're gonna to go way down into the deep south now. Uh, I, but I checked the map, and Catherine, you're still a little bit north of me, so why don't you go next? The Deep South. Um, I love it. I don't know that Atlanta's ever been characterized as the Deep South, but we'll take it. So, pulled up my app here. It's uh, a cool 84 degrees here in Atlanta with zero humidity. Um, I, uh, that was sarcastic, of course. Um, looks like it's going to be in the, the low 90s today. So, that's, uh, you know, in prior weeks, it was in the high 90s, so we're, we're thankful for that. Okay, so and, and let, now let's head to the, uh, the East Coast and a little further south. Uh, I'm in Charleston, South Carolina, and it's uh, looking out the window here, beautiful blue sky day. Uh, it's supposed to hit 91 degrees at around 1 p.m., and uh, that's, that's pretty typical for this time of year. Um, Okay, let's head uh, even further south. Uh, Brad is in uh, Siesta Keys, Florida. Yep, so it's on the west coast of Florida, below Tampa, and it's about right on the Gulf of Mexico. It's uh, 90 degrees today, but it's blue skies, sunny out, but usually late afternoon, it turns into rain during the summer months. Uh, but again, like Nadim, it's not as humid as it's been. It's been, you know, it's always brutal during the summer with humidity, but it only lasts for about two or three months and then it's paradise the rest of the year. <laughs> so I, I uh, am enjoying it. Probably after this, I might have time to take a dip in the pool at my lunch break. <laughs> and then I'm flying out uh, across the country for uh, some meetings. Nice. Okay, and our final stop on this, this uh, trip around the country is uh, Dallas, Texas. Megan, what's the weather supposed to be um, like today? It's a, it's a cool 99. Um, so <laughs> I think a nice reprieve from the 100 degree weather uh, yep. today. <laughs> so I'll take it, sadly. Yes. And here I was complaining about 92. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for the for the weather reports around the country and um, let's uh, let's get started. Um, good morning everybody and welcome to a special private equity career news webinar. 
The topic today is sharpening your sourcing strategy in anticipation of a down market. And uh, today we got word that um, we've just had two straight quarters of negative growth, so we're officially into uh, recession territory. Uh, I am David Toll. I'm the publisher of Private Equity Career News. I'm going to be your moderator for the program. I'd like to start out thanking our sponsor, SBS by Bain & Company. Uh, SBS is an award-winning provider of actionable data and analytics for private equity firms seeking to optimize their deal sourcing efforts. A few housekeeping announcements before we uh, dive into the program. A uh, friendly reminder to any reporters on the program today that we are off the record. Uh, please reach out to the speakers individually for permission if you'd like to use anything that they say today in an article. <clears throat> uh, second, you can download a copy of the slides from today's program directly from the handout section of your control panel. You can also find there a copy of the results of a survey of uh, business development professionals from last year, some really great data on industry practices. Uh, later today, I will send you a recording of the program, so no need to take uh, extensive notes. And finally, many of you asked questions of our panelists when you registered, and we will plan to address those during the discussion portion of the program. But please also ask questions at any time during the program from the question feature of, uh, of your control panel. Okay, so I'm grateful to have four expert speakers today to guide you through the topic, uh, starting with Nadim Malik, founder and CEO of New York City-based SBS by Bain & Company. Uh, Nadim will present statistics showcasing the state of the M&A market, and he'll also address the role that technology plays in helping deal originators see a higher percentage of relevant transactions. We also have Catherine Cesari. She is director of the financial sponsor group at investment bank William Blair, located in Atlanta. We have Megan Knipe. She is managing director of business development at private equity firm Blue Point Capital Partners. And Megan is located in uh, Dallas, Texas. And finally, we have Brad McAllen, head of financial sponsor coverage and deal origination at investment bank Pickwick Capital Partners, and Brad is located in uh, Siesta Keys, Florida. So let's find out a little bit more about our speakers and the industries they specialize in, um, starting with uh, starting with Catherine. Okay, thanks, thanks David. Um, Catherine Cesare here. I'm a director in William Blair's financial sponsor coverage and advisory group. I've been in the industry now for, for over 12 years, both as a sponsor coverage banker and as a tech banker. For those of you unfamiliar with William Blair on the line, William Blair is a global boutique investment bank. We're headquartered in Chicago. I'm, I'm based in our Atlanta office, but we're headquartered in Chicago. We're a private partnership and really a holistic advisor with M&A, corporate advisory and, and financing capabilities. We're really focused on growth oriented companies in the middle market. So our average transaction size on the low end is 100 million um, up to a billion plus. Really excited to, to be on today. Look forward to the presentation and, and discussion. So thanks again, David, for having me on. Thank you, Catherine. Megan, tell us about uh, Blue Point Capital Partners and, and your role there. Um, yes, yeah, so Megan Knipe, I lead business development for Blue Point. Um, as David mentioned, I am based in Dallas, but Blue Point is headquartered in Cleveland with offices in Seattle and Charlotte. Um, we focus on uh, the lower middle market, uh, seven to 40 million of EBITDA and the industrial consumer and business services sector. Uh, we have a couple value added capabilities that we like to offer to our businesses we partner with. We, we also have an office in Asia, which is helping our portfolio companies access the Asian market. Um, and then we have a team focused on data and digital improvement and on um, HR. Um, so like Catherine said, looking forward to this. Thank you, Megan. 
And uh, Brad, tell us some more about Pickwick Capital Partners and, and what you do. Sure. I'm Brad McGowan, Pickwick Capital. I'm an investment banker at the firm, but I lead our sponsor coverage uh, for the entire firm. And I also wear a second hat where I also do most of the or involved with much of the deal origination at our firm, speaking with actual corporate and strategic clients. Um, we deal in the lower middle market, uh, probably lower than my other guest panelists here in the lower, lower middle market, usually two to 10 million of EBITDA at the highest, preferably usually in that two to eight million EBITDA is more fair to say, probably. And uh, looking forward to the conference. Okay, fantastic. Um, let me now turn it over to Nadim Malik of SPS by Bain and Company to introduce himself and then to present some data to shed light on the current state of the market. Nadim? Thanks, David. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, wherever you are, I hope you're enjoying the summer and staying cool. We're seeing a real shift in the market right now with the uh, overall closed deal volume trending down consistently month over month since the beginning of the year. At SPS by Bain & Co, we're continuing to do what we do best, which is helping our clients position themselves for relevant deal sourcing opportunities and availing themselves of, uh, of data analytics, technology and automation to achieve that goal. Given this market, it's as good a time as any to get the perspective of our panelists who are great at what they do and have been doing it for a while, each of them grappling with many of the same questions and concerns as our audience. And before turning things over to them, I wanted to spend the next eight to 10 minutes walking through some slides that could help frame our conversation, starting with the overall uh, M&A and private equity deal volume, which you see on your screen right now. To put a further exclamation point on the staggering volume of deal activity in 2021, uh, PE activity was up around 50% compared to 2020 and was the first year private equity outpaced corporate buyers as a share of overall M&A volume. Looking at the first half of 2022, so far, it's just slightly below first half of 2021 level. But that's a little misleading. Uh, there was a record number of deal closing announcements in January of this year, and since then, there's been a steady decline every month. And if that trend were to continue into the second half of the year, the overall decrease year over year would be much more pronounced. But moving on to the next slide, before I show a breakdown of how deal activity sh has shaken out so far by sector, I just wanted to point out that the chart will look different because we have a new sector taxonomy. Uh, why is this important? Well, I've been in the financial data and information collection space for over two decades, working in private equity with private equity firms. Oh, there's a real problem and challenge around applying SIC codes, other kind of generic industry trees and sector trees uh, to run searches and call the data. I mean, what good is having large volumes of information if you can't officially, uh, efficiently, I meant to say, you know, slice and dice that data, have takeaways, come up with analysis that are relevant for you. So our parent, Bain and Company, as the top consultant to private equity um, and serving the corporate M&A markets for the last two decades have developed a four-tiered industry taxonomy that at its deepest level has five, over 560 subsectors. It's, it's nothing like I've ever seen. And it solves a real problem that exists in the market today, and it's a game changer. It's uh, complemented by a business focus at a higher level and um, uh, really allows our clients to uh, cut, cut through the noise and efficiently come up with takeaways, get more specific and targeted in their searches and strategies in ways that they can't by other means. So really excited about that. And then moving to the next slide, here's a look at the most active sectors for PE activity using the highest level of that taxonomy on those categories. Um, uh, the tech and healthcare sectors, which have led the charge in the last few years, are down the most sharply. 
uh, in the first half of the year compared to last year, with industrials holding their ground, just down slightly so far this year. And, and when the dust settles and first half numbers are even more uh, comprehensive, that might come out to being pretty much even. Moving on to the next slide, the trend in prior years of the buy and build and roll up strategy not only has continued in 2022 so far, but has accelerated with uh, PE firms now completing almost three add-on deals for every platform. Uh, I think we can expect this trend to continue as 2022 progresses. A lot of our clients are making a much more concentrated deal sourcing effort in finding smaller add-ons where some of the macro and global factors impacting the markets are less prominent. And uh, our new sector taxonomy can certainly aid in creating more granular searches and takeaways along these lines. Uh, moving to the next slide, you know, if, if closed deal activity is indeed going to continue to taper, I can say it's not really showing up in private equity pipeline stats. Uh, looking at this chart, which shows you median quarterly deal flow by private equity firms, uh, Q2 2022 came in pretty high. It's the highest second quarter we've ever had since we began tracking the data and the second highest quarter ever. And uh, I guess the question is, will these deals close or not? Or could they end up stalling with everything going on in the world right now? Or are there just fewer opportunities that are being shopped more aggressively and hence showing up in more and more private equity pipelines that weren't before? I guess we'll have to see, time will tell, and, and I look forward to getting some views from the panelists on, on this topic. Moving on to the next slide. Speaking of deals closing versus not closing, here's an, an analysis we publish annually in a series called The Science of Deal Sourcing 101. There's a lot going on in this chart, so let me just walk everyone through this. The columns represent median quarterly deal flow for PE firms similar to the prior slide, which have risen steadily, as you can see, with the exception of the first few quarters of COVID in 2020, and then Q4 2021, when not a, not a lot of new deals were coming to market due to capacity constraints. The line and percentage represents the percentage of those deals launched in that quarter that actually end up trading, that end up closing at all. So if you're not familiar with this slide or some of our other content and messaging, then this percentage will come as a surprise to you. It's true that only about 30 to 40% of deals that private equity firms see and log actually end up trading at all. And looks like that line over time has just been declining slightly. Um, if you take a look at how that percentage dipped during COVID in early 2020, it kind of lends credibility to the data because we would expect a higher than typical share of deals that launch during that time to not end up trading. And I'm wondering if the deals launched now with all the uncertainty regarding inflation, the debate on if we are in a recession technically or are we not or how deep is it going to be, Ukraine, supply chain challenges, rising interest rates, not to mention that some businesses actually got a COVID bump in performance, uh, making it really challenging to forecast what the future is going to look like. Will all of these factors cause a decline in this closing rate and, and, and we're going to end up seeing a lot of uh, stale and broken deals? I'm not sure. Um, let's see in, in the years ahead how this chart shakes out, but I'd be curious to get the panelists' views on this as well. Um, and finally, if we move to the next slide, you know, if you're going to be traveling, um, Brad, you mentioned you're hitting the road uh, with COVID behind us. More and more people are doing this. It's great to be out there seeing people uh, face to face. But just a reminder, you need to know where to go that, you know, so much has changed. We saw so we saw so much deal volume last year and so much churn just in the intermediary landscape, not to mention finance sponsors and new firms coming up. So the, the landscape has changed dramatically. New firms have come up, professionals have shifted locations. Use the SPS portal to do your travel planning. Create a heat map similar to the one like this that'll show you 
where are the deal sourcing professionals that you target, whether they're intermediaries, alternative deal sourcers, private equity folks, lenders, however you source deals from your market, where are they based? Um, you know, drill down even further, uh, pick, you know, which intermediaries run the most limited processes. I'm sure those boutique below the radar shops would love to have a, the attention and a, a meeting in person. Or, or maybe pick your blind spot where folk, you run this search based on, on deals that, that have fallen through the cracks that you're missing. And then once you've decided where to go, you can drill down into a city view and plan your trip from building to building and street to street, who's where. And then finally, use your mobile app when you're in a location. And uh, when you have that uh, inevitable lunch or coffee cancellation that comes up, the mobile app has the geospatial ability and will tell you who else is in the building or around the corner. I know if it were me, I would love to get a call uh, from a friendly voice uh, pulling me away from my desk, seeing if they want to grab a quick coffee or, or lunch. So uh, with that, I'd like to turn it back to uh, our moderator, David, and our panelists for our discussion and Q&A. Uh, thank you, Nadine. Um, Nadim, I seem to recall that uh, the last webinar you were you were predicting of an inflection point in the M and A market. I wonder if you could prognosticate again, and what what do you think for sort of the second half of the year? And do you think we can recapture some ground lost in the first half, or is are we going to see a down year? Uh, personally, David, my view is that it's going to continue to trend downward in terms of closed M&A deal activity. There's two perspectives, right, that, that will shape next year. The first is closed deal volume itself. And we just did an internal review on the team of our data. And like I mentioned earlier in my opening remarks, closed deal activity has months, every month has had fewer closed deals than the prior month so far this year. So, but that's closed deal activity. But then, if you're asking to forecast what closed deal activity in the second half is going to look like, well, then you have to look at deal pipelines. They, they seem to be pretty robust right now. So, um, but anecdotally, the conversations I'm having with investment bankers, private equity folks, and certainly the other people on this panel are going to be uh, much better equipped to answer this question than I am. That, you know, especially the further you go up market of any sizable transaction, some of the factors that I mentioned are making it hard to close deals. Is, you know, can a buyer and seller come to an agreement on what a, what a company should be valued at? The only, the only area where, based on our conversations, we're seeing consistent flow and closed deal activity is on the lower end of the market where, where Brad um, does deals. And, you know, those, those smaller deals that maybe What's going on in Ukraine or supply chain and, and other areas is less of an impact and the seller decides to sell when they're, when they're ready to sell. And, and it, it's not based on these other factors, but, um, but certainly Megan is gonna have a perspective in terms of deal flow, what she's seeing, what they expect, how they're planning, and Catherine as well. You know, at, at Blair, they're one of the top uh, advisors in the middle market. Uh, certainly on the largest of the large deals, yes, valuation and, and this type of uh, uh, transaction around these, these issues are, are, are creating a sell. So if I, my forecast is, uh, you know, first half of a year is down 15% right now, um, but that's really boosted up by a very rich January. I think at the end of the year, it could be, you know, probably down around 20, 25% for the year. Okay. Um, thank you, Nadim. And uh, speaking of predictions, I'd like to get uh, some feedback from the audience. So I'm going to kick things off with a uh, with a pair of polling questions to uh, take advantage of the fact we have a really large audience today. So the first polling question for everyone is: How do you expect your total number of closed platform deals this year to compare with last year? And and this may take a second to launch, but we'll give it a moment. All right, so go ahead and uh, 
make your selections. Your choices are down from last year, even with last year, up to 10% higher than last year and more than 10% higher than last year. And we're just talking about platform deals here. Okay, I'm going <clears throat> to close the poll and share the results. Okay, so um, so yeah, in uh, pretty consistent with what we just heard from Nadim. More than half of you say you expect the total number of platform deals this year to be uh, to be down from last year, and another third saying even with last year, very few people on the line expect um, expect vo uh, deal volume to rise on the platform side. Okay, we're going to do one more polling question, very closely related, and this is how do you expect your firm's total number of add-on deals to compare this year with, with last year? And again, you have the same choices for answers, so go ahead and make your selections. We're talking about add-on transactions down from last year, even with last year up to 10% higher, more than 10% higher. And let's give me a moment to share the results. Okay, well, that's interesting. This is uh, very different from what we just saw. So in terms of add-ons, there's a little more optimism that um, the number that you do this year is going to be at least uh, what you did last year, if not, if not higher. So, uh, so very interesting. So let's get into uh, a discussion uh, portion of the program and a friendly reminder, please feel free to ask questions at any time using the, uh, the question feature on your control panel. So let's start off with the big picture first and then we'll we'll drill into some specifics as we uh, as we go along um, so the first thing i want to hear from each panelist in turn is just what what it's looking like out there in terms of the quantity and quality of deal flow and uh, brad we'll start with you and maybe remind folks the kinds of deals that you uh, that you work on there okay so i Again, I'm at Pickwick, which is the lower middle market. And I think Nadim hit it spot on that the lower middle market has not suffered as much as some of the true middle or larger deals at the larger firms. Um, again, we saw a big, you know, Q1 saw a lot of the spillover from the except, exceptionally strong fourth quarter of last year. And then it kind of took a little dip because of not only uh, the, the the war, the post Ukraine war, it was announced, so people took a little break. And then our deals have continued to increase as far as deal flow. However, we're starting to see a little bit of the quality go down a little bit on the financial side of the, where the firms are good, but financially they're not as good shape as what we had seen in the past. And they might be a little quicker to go either raise a round of capital, emerging growth capital, or to sell because they know that possibly it could get a little slower or worse for them and their clients going forward. But overall, the lower middle market deal flow has not been affected as much as some of my panelists. and. Uh, we, you know, I'll save my other comments for later for certain sectors and things like that. Okay, thanks, Brad. And um, Catherine, why don't we uh, we turn to you also on the investment banking side of, of things and what are you seeing in terms of quantity and quality of, of deal flow right now? Yeah, listen, our, our pipeline continues to be robust this year and the quality of our, our, our deal flow is, is really high. We actually have a proprietary 
in-house team of data scientists that um, have built an algorithm to score all of our mandates that we take on. And that score is actually at an all-time high right now. Um, so, you know, I was I actually pulled some stats from looking at deal launches and pitches and, you know, year to date this year compared to last year. And similar to Nadine, your stats, you know, we're in the, we're, we're down in the kind of high single digits. But if you, if you compare year to date this year from a pre-COVID level, we're, we're still up, you know, in terms of deal launches, close to 40%, pitches close to 40%. So I, I'd say the headline is that we, we, we have a robust pipeline. We still have a lot of deals to launch in the back half of this year. Roughly 60% of our remaining 2022 pipeline, again, that's engaged deals, are in the pre-MP phase. So. Okay, so um, still uh, things looking cautiously optimistic. There. Yeah. And Catherine, uh, thank you. And Megan, let's uh, let's turn to you on the buy side of the market. Um, what what are you seeing in terms of quantity and quality of deal flow? Yeah, I'd say Q1 um, it, just from how it felt felt pretty slow. But when I actually looked at the data, we were up pretty significantly versus last year as far as deals. But definitely quality was way down. I think a bunch of people that couldn't get deals out last year tried to push them in in the first quarter. Um, I think there's like deal fatigue from last year as well. Um, but coming into Q2, deal flow remained really strong, and we saw towards the end of the quarter quality really pick up significantly like when we look at kind of how many bids we submitted on platforms it really started ramping up kind of the second half of q2 and then seeing really good quality in the beginning of q3 so i think this is going to be a really back and weighted year as far as kind of you know platforms closing so we're you know cautiously optimistic for the rest of the year as well okay thanks uh, thanks megan um i'd like to turn to uh, both of the investment bankers on this panel, um, we'll start with Brad and go to Catherine. And I, I would really love to know what what subsectors are sort of heating up with sponsors right now, and on the flip side of the coin, what might be what might be cooling off a bit. Brad, well, sure. Uh, at Pickwick, we've always specialized one specific area and that is security that's physical security cyber security homeland security along with that we kind of lump it in with the industrials aerospace and defense on the small side small government contractors we have a very superb team that i've been associated with at three different firms over the last almost 18 years and we're very competitive in the market on that specific sector that is usually quote unquote a defensive sector when markets are turning down the industrials you know the precision machining companies the that are involved with aerospace and space and defense and security are certainly not going away if anything there's been more emphasis on getting into those sectors and what we've been seeing is there's been a whole lot of extra add-on activity since we deal in the lower middle market, some of the larger firms do still contact us specifically because of our expertise in these sectors, our affiliation with another firm that is involved with, is a top uh, buy side advisor on aerospace and defense in the country, in DC. And they look for smaller emerging growth companies that are doing well in these sectors to to add on to a large platform and that keeps us very busy year round we're seeing more and more buy side opportunities which we've time we, we unless it's very focused we stay away from we mostly do sell side and capital raises and lately we've been doing a lot more buy side activity for the larger firms looking to add on these specific sectors on top of that those sectors which we do focus on we're very good in we have three healthcare teams and uh and the services the business services where you you can show the arr you know annual uh reoccurring revenue that is increasing in the business services area that still seems to stay strong as well that's what okay. we're focused on 
Okay, Brad, that, that all makes uh, that all makes good sense. And Catherine, you're uh, you're uh, working on growth, uh, fast growing companies, fast growing industries. Um, but if you drill down with into the into the subsectors, you know, some of the taxonomy that we saw from Nadim earlier, where are the where are the areas that are heating up and what's what's cooling off? Yeah, you know, I was surprised to see um, Nadine on the slides that you shared that that healthcare and tech were trending um, down uh, because that's that's actually the opposite of what we're experiencing um, at, at Blair um, this year. You know, tech and healthcare are outperforming despite the public um, tech sell-off. You know, I, I'd say industries that were increasingly um, seeing buyers shift away from in light of the, the current economic um, environment is more kind of consumer discretionary model, uh, you know, where, the, where there's a model tied to con the consumer spending, um, any sort of cyclicality. So there's been more of a focus on on the underlying business model and, and criteria. So you know, focused on more focused on asset light models, tech enabled or, or the opportunity to implement technology to, to drive growth and more focus on recession resistant models that are really defensible in a down market. We're, we're starting to see at least more focus on that right now. Um, and then, you know, if you look at the, if you look at the global, and, and again, you, you showed us earlier, Nadine, that um, industrials is holding its ground, so to speak. But if you look at the global M&A trends over the last decade, there's been this multi-year downward trend for services and industrial. Um, so whereas tech and healthcare have have experienced a pretty pretty big uplift. Okay, and Catherine, you said um, consumer discretionary, uh, maybe yeah. becoming a little chop liver with with sponsors. And Megan, I know you do a lot of consumer deals there, so we really want to hear from you. What what do you like right now, and what are you avoiding right now? Yeah, I'll touch on consumer first since um, that's what you mentioned. So I think we're we're definitely more risk off on this consumer discretionary. Um, one, just you know, potential uh, recession impact, but also if you think about some of the cons consumer discretionary verticals like household products or your things like that, um, you know, they're kind of had a, a lot of them had a COVID bump or a run up, and I still feel like we're trying to figure out what the new normal from work from home is. Um, you know, kind of the outdoor space, whether it's building products or outdoor furniture, or outdoor things like that. Those also experienced, you know, a lot of lift during the COVID time frame. So I think it's not wanting to buy at the top and also being uh, concerned about kind of inflationary pressures. So we're trying to, you know, stay away from things like that. But I think, you know, when it comes to food, um, we, we really like that space, you know, more of the consumer staples. Um, I also mentioned kind of some of the outdoor furniture, also building products, I think has experienced a large run up over the last couple of years who are a little bit more uh, concerned around building products. But I'd say, you know, general industrials and services is, and then kind of consumer staples food is where we're spending the most of our time. Um, kind of coming into COVID, there was like a mini kind of industrial recession. So um, Nadim, based on your slide, we, we're seeing the same thing as like really good, strong industrial flow. And that's kind of the legacy of the firm. Um, so we're we're evaluating that and services both on white collar and blue collar. One one interesting thing that uh, on the consumer spending front, um, I was reading an article in the journal yesterday that um, all these consumer discretionary companies like Unilever and and even Coca Cola, like they're just continuing to pass these cost increases to the consumer. And then so far, the consumer has been really resilient and has absorbed these price increases, but you know, how long can that really, really last for? So it'll be interesting to to continue to watch that over the next uh, quarter or so. And, uh, you know, um, if there's going to be start, you know, start to see some some pullback there. I, for one, have started to pull back on uh, on on spending. So I'm not sure if that's statistically uh, significant, but uh, no, no more luxuries in the, the total household here. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, to Catherine's point, you know, one of the things we are um, looking at when evaluating companies is kind of the commodity impact and the ability to pass along costs and the business that we're evaluating, how much of growth in 21 was 
from a the cost increase or the you know passing along the cost um, versus you know actual top line growth. Um, and so we're kind of looking at that moving forward is, is in addition to kind of consumer discretionary as we're evaluating deals. Um, Cause I, I do think we're kind of nearing the top end. And I think gas prices, et cetera, et cetera, it's becoming you know, harder and harder for the consumer to continue at the level that we're at now. Say Megan, is there a, uh, a company that you acquired uh, recently within the last few months that, that you're just super excited about because you think it's, it's just very well positioned for the economic conditions that we're that we're finding ourselves in. Yeah, there are. are um, it was kind of late last year. We we acquired a, a few platforms. I think um, two of which are very well positioned. One is a business called National On Demand, which is um, new fiber installation and last fire fiber last mile fiber connectivity, um, and that's really you know. That was an issue. There's like a lack of connectivity in the U.S. and COVID really highlighted that. So there's a lot of um, there's an art off program from the government that's um, helping these telecom companies put fiber into rural areas. And that business is based in the southeast. And a lot of the southeast is having uh, it doesn't have a lot of connectivity. And so I think we're, there's a ton of tailwinds in that space and will continue to be regardless of recession. Um, and then also an, another business we invested in, Brimar, which is in safety products which is mainly OSHA mandated. Um, I think safety, you know, pre-COVID was a great space to be in. I think post-COVID even better space. So really liking the trends for both of those businesses. I think they're um, resilient. Super, those, uh, those sound like winners. Um, let's, turn to, uh, let's turn to Catherine. Of course, uh, nothing really uh, uh, brings a, a, a private equity market to a grinding halt like a like a credit crunch, uh, so it's really important that um, uh, the credit markets hold up. And Catherine, what what are you seeing on that? Yeah, topic? well, I, I'm sure everybody on the line was was watching the Fed yesterday with uh, another rate increase. I'd say you know the syndicated markets are are, are really closed right now, but but the le direct lenders are still open. I think we're starting to see some cracks in the in the direct lending market um, too. You know, pricing has gone up 50 to 75 basis points, and SOFR has gone above the floor, but not materially enough to really significantly impact pricing. There's still a ton of liquidity out there. Um, some some interesting trends we are seeing is that hold sizes are starting to come down. Um, there was a a recent Bloomberg article um, that that estimated the maximum private equity uh, private credit facility size was is now currently in about two billion versus, versus six months ago it was five billion so I'd say you know the the, the debt markets just need to be kind of cautiously navigated uh, the direct lending market is still open and, and in terms of debt strategy you know really uh, lean on your incumbent lender, lenders to support deals. I think that's that's something that we're really seeing play out in our processes. And uh, Megan, are you, are you feeling like the uh, the lenders out there are still so friendly and cooperative and excited to do new deals? Yeah, we're on the more conservative side of leverage. So um, we're not really experiencing any issues. And, and some of the deals that we're kind of further along on, you know, are in um, more of the services category, which we haven't seen, you know, any pullback. Um, and, and like Catherine said, we are looking to kind of a incumbent lenders or lenders we have really good relationships with that know Bluepoint well and know our history in certain um, verticals. So we're, we're, you know, a lot of the time we're going to them and, and getting good uh, leverage reads. Okay, um, so that's uh, that's comforting and and um, good to hear. Uh, I also am very interested in what's going on with deal pricing, uh, especially since we can all see what's going on with deal pricing in the public equity markets, and it hasn't been good for our retirement accounts. Uh, Brad, what are you seeing? Yeah, sure. Uh, on so the, on the, the deal front line, I'm on the front line of a lot of these uh, deal processes and speaking with the sponsors, and the sponsors definitely still have the upper hand with the amount of cash and dry powder that they have accumulated or a new fund that they've raised. So they're still in the driver's seat. However, they're able to bid a lot more aggressively now. 
And they're actually, we've seen it happen on a couple, two deals specifically that we've had. Uh, they're using the downturn in the economy uh, to their advantage saying, hey, you know, the economy is going down. We'd like to come in, but, you know, based on the pricing, we might come in a little lower. And they're also using the public comps, the comp valuations of the publicly traded companies to use on a private company situation to also give them more, more, uh, more power behind their potential bid on a company or a raise for a company to come in at a lower valuation. So they're using it to their advantage more so now than they never had to do that, but now they're starting to do that. And we have to come up with more and more arguments of why we thwart we fight for our company versus what their valuations might be. So we're seeing a lot more of that in the market lately. And uh, and Brad, you, and I'll, I'll give you an example. Even on a secu on a private, secu well to do security company, say making fifteen to twenty million in revenue and a couple million in EBITDA, uh, a company came in at a wanted to do it, wanted to be the lead, and that's great until they threw out a valuation number that was below what the guidance was from the company and the board of directors actually voted and told them to scram, we're not taking it. And that's the first time that's happened in a long time where we've actually had an investor excited about investing, came up with the whole deal, wanted to do the whole thing themselves, loved the company, but they used the public market comps and the fear of the future and the market going down to low bid this company and our, our the board of directors of this company came back and told us to tell them to beat it. And we told them to beat it and we're going back out in the market next week. So that's live actionable uh, example. And uh, Catherine, how about you? What are you seeing with purchase price price multiples over the, over the past few months? Yeah. I, I, I mean, to Brad's point, they're, they're, um, there certainly is a can be a disconnect in terms of and, and within certain se uh, sectors in particular tech being being one that um, yeah. comes to mind immediately given what we're seeing in the public markets and um, you know people are still kind of locked in um, into into a multiple that um, you know a, a lot of these private equity funds just can't can't underwrite because they're looking at the public markets for support. So um, I think that's a good transition maybe into a, a, you know our next question in terms of um, the, the, the bid, how, how do you kind of close the gap and in, in this disconnect in valuation expectations? Um, and I, I, I think you know there are a number of ways you know we can you can get creative to, to bridge the gap. One thing that, that we're seeing a lot of are the structured deals are increasingly being proposed as a way to, to bid value gaps. You know, earnouts can be a solution too. There, there are a number of things, but I think what we're what we're focused on right now as a holistic advisor, there, there are a lot of alternatives to a full sale, especially in light of tighter valuation markets. So we're really focused on understanding our clients' objectives in this market. So, you know, examples of alternatives could be a minority sale or or selling a, a, a slug to a, a close relationship, um, doing a shared governance deal. We're starting to see a lot of a, a lot of more of that. Um, you know, we're you know less than 50% deal. You can keep your debt in place, particularly if there's a debt shortfall. So there's we're starting to see more you know creative um, alternatives to just a full out sale, and that can that can help bridge the gap between buyers and sellers. But curious to see here what what others are seeing too megan are you uh are you open to more um i don't know creativity when it comes to structuring deals uh these days to get them done what, what's your uh approach yeah i think it depends on the, the business um you know with an, a larger add-on we did last year you know it was hard to tell kind of what covid impact was in the numbers and so we ended up doing an earn out and the owners felt you know strong about their performance so we kind of agreed to that and kept value the same um but it's from the valuations topic it's it's interesting because i feel like it's 
pretty barbelled. It's kind of like the flight to quality. So anything quality or in, you know, specifically services that we're seeing really, so really, really strong valuations. I think um, in services, there's like the least to underwrite. It's just really kind of labor, which is kind of an issue pre-COVID. Um, so we're both blue collar and white collar are seeing kind of things still be really aggressive. But in other verticals, I think there might be opportunity based on your, you know, sector expertise or angles to get in something maybe, um, a little bit lower valuation than 21. Um, but yeah, we're, I think we're trying to be creative on structure depending upon the industry. And But I think if it's like a really good quality asset, you know, it's very competitive and it's kind of business as usual, like in 21. That's a good point too, Megan. I think, you know, for a quality asset, we're not seeing any, any, uh, any movement or deterioration in multiples. Um, and we're still seeing, you know, accelerated processes on very aggressive timelines, people preempting. So that's a that's a really, really good point. But with with businesses where there is um, some cyclicality or some, you know, um, exposure to end markets like travel and leisure, for example, um, you know, would those be uh, saleable assets in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a great market? Yes, of course, uh, but now it's 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 causing people to kind of pause a little bit. So, this flight to quality is something that um, that the buyers are very very focused on. Lenders too. Um, Megan, I want to go back to you and uh, ask about um, how your approach to deal sourcing is evolving um, in light of now we're. Looks like we're two quarters into a recession. Uh, we're at the tail end of a, a historic uh, pandemic. Um, what kinds of uh, strategies are you taking on the deal sourcing front to sort of keep uh, keep on top of those trends? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, doing um, more um with our different sponsor coverage bankers like Catherine doing kind of more monthly calls like keeping a pulse on the market seeing um you know what they're thinking about launching and sectors also I think we're trying to be more thesis driven um so really kind of going deep on different verticals you know really underwriting that feeling comfortable in this market investing and then when we find something you know whether it's preempting or trying just getting an early look um to really have more time with the business, more time with the owners, feel more confident when we're closing. So we're working on that, um, you know, just trying to talk to the different sector bankers to keep a pulse, not only for where we have uh, portfolio companies, but where we're hoping to invest. Um, so really moving more to a, a sector focus strategy. Um, and I mean, I think the market's moving that way anyway, but I just think right now you have to be very confident in your investment strategy and, and the kind of the drivers of the different verticals that you're investing by. And then pairing that with kind of operating partners and people that you know boots on the ground that you know know what's going on. All right, um, that's that's interesting. And and Brad, uh, from your perspective, now you're you're seeing what sponsors are doing, kind of to get um, to get your attention and to uh, to see what you're working on. What 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 do you like? in terms of the strategies that the sponsors are pursuing and, and what's not working for you? Well, I, I definitely believe in the sector expertise and the operating partners behind that because that gives a potential buyer a lot more insight and having true sector bankers with a lot of experience behind at the table to speak with potential clients. But uh, we, we at our firm, which is a smaller firm than most of the others out there, you know, have, have started to even adopt new ways of of uh, marketing and networking within to to get clients. And we we start instead of just the normal you know calling customers like in the past or doing cold call, and that that doesn't work as well anymore. Obviously, we've been doing a lot of in person meetings flying to see customers having them in our offices obviously everyone's adopted the zoom calls that's worked well during the covid and still to this day we utilize that quite a bit and uh the other area is just having customers of our potential target clients that we want to call on 
having their customers that we might know, talking to the company, putting good words in about our firm and what we do and how we represent at other companies works well with referrals from their own customers to the CEOs and CFOs. And that's where I'm very well to get their attention to start to speak to us. And, you know, obviously there's always LinkedIn, which has worked great too. Um, and then our firms for the first time ever is considering using a firm like Nadim's to go out and uh, they're, they're doing research. So Nadim, I'd like to include you on that. <laughs> they're starting to uh, think about how to use a, a third party to outreach to specific areas, uh, whether it's healthcare or security or defense areas on lower middle market firms that we want to uh, kind of target as potential clients. It's, it's all new. We, we've already used a, a service called Axial in the past, and that's worked fine. And InterXO is another one I guess our firm has used, and they want to get more. And they've actually hired uh, two people at my firm to oversee this process and start doing a research report on how the, the services compare and the costs and things like that. So we're, we're getting more and more into the networking and in-person networking and finding more deal flow other than just myself and a couple of the bankers that are versed in speaking about and speaking to companies and are pretty personable. Thanks, Brad. And um, we are coming up to uh, the 15 minute mark left in the program. So I wanna encourage everyone um, to ask questions through the uh, question feature on your control panel. We have several queued up, so I'm just going to start um, uh, going through them. Uh, first one for Catherine, are you doing any direct cold outreach to potential issuers? And if so, is it cold calling, cold email, some other strategy? What's, uh, what's the approach today? Cold calling? Um, I, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm not sure I, I understand the, the question, but um, no, I, I, no, not, not currently. Okay, I think the question has to do with how you're, how you're finding out about companies that are, that are gonna be coming for sale and are you- Got it. Um, how, yeah, how aggressively I, are you? Sure, you know, we, um, that, that's part of, of my my role um, I, have a, I have a team of um, colleagues on the sponsor coverage and advisory side but we actively cover over 500 private equity funds private equity is our our largest source of deal flow um, now we ironically end up selling to about 50 percent of our of our, our of our m a sell sides um, trade to strategics and 50 percent to private equity but um, the overwhelming majority of our of our sell sides are are sourced from private equity funds. So private equity is a very is a critically important source of deal flow for us, and and that's part of my role um, is to you know work directly with, with with Megan and others to make sure that we're staying in front of um, their portfolio and and adding value along the way through their whole period, so that when it is time to um, bring to market and you know throughout their whole period that we're, we're well positioned. So um, it, it's not a, a cold calling um, source of uh, referral that comes in. It's it's hopefully very repeat, uh, as, as much as uh, the service industry can be repeat. Um, we do a really great job of that at Blair is, um, you know, staying in front of our um, of our clients and, and getting kind of the round trip um, through the through the cycle of a company's uh, growth. Okay. Hopefully that answers the, the question. Yeah, absolutely. And um, Catherine, we'll stick with you. You mentioned um, how pricing on uh, loans has been rising. I think you mentioned 50 to 75 basis points. Um, someone would also like to know what leverage multiples are you seeing? Maybe start with Catherine and Brad. You could weigh in as yeah. well. It, cer it, it certainly depends on the sector. Um, so, you know, um, pricing for, um, we just, um, you know, engaged a services business 
last week um, that was, you know, that's doing kind of 25 to 30 of EBITDA, call it. And we got a leverage read in, in you know, the five, five times range. So it, it certainly depends across sectors, of course, but yeah, curious, um, Megan, you or, or Brad, um, what, what you're seeing. We've been getting uh, talking to companies and talking to them about possible pricing and talking to PE funds as well about potential uh, deals coming to market to get their initial maybe pre-look opinions and what they're seeing. And, uh, you know, it depends on what sector, obviously. But, but for example, in uh, healthcare, uh, a lot of service type businesses we've been speaking with our teams. One of them that we brought to market for sale was a $250 million <laughs> doing 52 million of EBITDA, which is unlike our firm, much, much larger. But when we first started talking to them, it was doing about 4 million in the EBITDA, and then the COVID hit. And like Nadine said, some of these firms have benefited greatly. In the short term, they went up to 30 million after the first year and 52 million of EBITDA in the second year of COVID. It's an urgent care, chain of urgent care centers throughout the Northeast. And uh, it, a lot of firms had difficulty in putting a multiple on this company because of the COVID issue. It's never happened before. And they all came in a little bit lower. And that, that assignment did not get sold, even though there was 41 firms signed an NDA and 20 had actual bids. Uh, but the owner decided to back away and he actually is now turning it into a buy side to get larger and buy other competitors that are down and out and then go back to market. So it all depends what sector, but like, for example, in the technology security sector, uh, some of these multiples are as high as 10 to 12 times, even for small companies in the four or 5 million EBITDA level, even in the $2 million EBITDA level, we've seen some even trade as high as 15 times their EBITDA and, uh, and even two times even sales, which is pretty high compared to previous. So we, uh, it depends what sector, but we're not really finding that as a big issue at all because it's the lower middle market. It's mostly just founder founders and privately owned and it's a lot less, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of more intricacies and more in the vibe of the owner <laughs> and how he feels with a potential suitor or a purchaser and how the how the chemistry really comes together is i would say that's even more important yeah. thanks uh, yeah i'd thanks. say across across the board we're we're seeing leverage leverage levels are are, are down only only really modestly uh, like a quarter to half half turn um, so not enough to to really blow up uh, an LBO. Yeah, and, and one more I'd like to add. And so since our companies are a lot smaller, we don't get involved all the time with with leverage. Uh, a lot of PE firms would rather just buy the company outright cash, or make a minority investment, maybe once in a while, maybe 30% of the time a, a lender might come into the picture to help with that purchase, but it's not as often as maybe it's my other panelists. Okay, thank you, Brad. And we're gonna switch gears a little bit with this next audience question for Nadim. Nadim, can you kind of speak to the rate at which private equity firms, investment banks have been adopting technology as part of their sourcing and due diligence process, including artificial intelligence. Yeah. On the deal sourcing side, certainly, I think we're at a time and age where people recognize that uh, um, there's time constraints. It's our most precious commodity. And technology, analytics, automation, all of this stuff, it's not in any way there to threaten the relationship building aspect of this or displace anything, it's, it's there to create efficiencies. It's great to create point direction 
you know, to where which relationships are going to be the best use of your time. And um, there's been there's been uh, you know it's, you know this type of adoption takes time, and some firms are further up the curve than others. Uh, others are just getting started, but I do still feel overall the private equity industry is is very much in the early stages of technology and uh, adoption in, 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 in its deal sourcing and its in its um, due diligence and other and other core competencies that that drive fund performance and fundraising. I would say artificial intelligence is. Even earlier, in, 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 you know, people are experimenting with that. I think there's vendors out there that are positioning themselves that have some form of AI. Um, but but I think there's a lot of opportunity here uh, in private equity in the years ahead for that to come into play to drive deal sourcing even even more and create more efficiencies and 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 create uh, create that. And and when it comes to deal sourcing strategies themselves, I mean. There's nothing more uh, important or critical than the relationship building aspect of it. Yeah. And, and what we're seeing in, in the shift of the market right now, you know, it's a, each firm's a little different. You know, at the very least, last year, it was so busy. You were drinking from a fire hose. You're being more reactive. You know, it might be time to just uh, brush up clean up, screen, screen your, your intermediaries and relationships and contact data, re-tier them, um, especially those boutique ones that you haven't visited in a while. The deal flow is going to slow down. Having those tierings and those data and technology in place is going to give you a serious advantage. Other strategies, a lot of our private equity firm clients are now being selective and thoughtful about identifying private equity assets that are attractive to them the specific individuals that whose portfolio they're in and, and and finding a way to reach out to them directly, at least get access to the management team, even if they do end up going to market, to figure out if how much time do they really want to spend on the deal beforehand. And then depending on who you talk to, the other strategy that's that's picking up right now is, you know, the the, the broken deal. I think there there's some firms that I talk to that that feel like in this market there's going to be especially perhaps on the larger deals, but it could be across the board that deals are going to stall. They're not going to trade. Buyers and sellers don't have the same expectations right now. So what what can we do to avail ourselves of, of those opportunities where the seller does have a mindset to sell? Um, there wasn't a mis there was a mismatch initially, but can, is there an opportunity to come back and, and, and do that deal? And so, those are some of the strategies, and certainly technology and automation can help drive those and create efficiencies. But there's really no substitute for relationship building and and, and, and that you know that, that kind of rapport that you have and trust that you get to build. Um, and technology, whether it's Zoom or some other platform or, or or a service such as ours, just enables that relationship building. Thanks, my dear. Megan, um, have you are uh, just following along what? Nadine just said, have, have you been uh, getting more interested in broken deals or underperforming companies, opportunities that, that might be fleeting, you know, just sort of a, uh, a, a factor of, of, you know, the recession that we're in? Yeah, I think, you know, what we're doing is, you know, some of the businesses that we're looking at, if we maybe don't get a management presentation, but know the industry well and feel like, there might be some retrading. We kind of communicate that to the banker and stay close to the asset just in case people do retrade and then we can get back in. Um, there was a deal that we looked at earlier this year that was a broken process and we we got um, another look at it um, just by communicating to the banker. Um, we're, we're also uh, just given our expertise in Asia. If there's kind of supply chain issues, people are coming to us one off to see, hey, since y'all have an office there and y'all have a really strong supply chain presence, you feel comfortable underwriting this deal. So we're trying to use some of our capabilities to our advantage. And there are a couple of conversations we're having one off where the buyer's expectations are reasonable and they really need a true partner. And we're trying to leverage those our expertise there. So yeah, we are less on the on the broken deal side, but more on deals that are engaged and they're trying to figure out the right timing. Maybe we're getting in early 
to see if we can get to um, evaluation that's suitable for both us and the seller. Cool. Um, okay, this next question is again for the investment bankers on the panel. Maybe we'll start with Catherine. Um, compared with previous recessions, do you think that private company valuations are going to be more insulated, uh, not, say not highly discounted, relative to the devaluations we're seeing in the public markets? So obviously, Catherine, we're seeing a lot of uh, air come out of the valuations of, of fast-growing companies and technology and healthcare. How is that translating uh, to the private markets? We're not, I mean, we're not seeing that trickle down to the private markets yet. Um, you know, I think, um, um, lost my train of thought here. Uh, yeah, I think the reality is we're not seeing that, we're not seeing that price sensi sensitivity hit the private markets yet. Um, you know, if anything, we're, we're what well, we were prior, previously focused on running narrower processes, and we still we still are. I think you, you know, as as the markets continue to tighten, you probably it, it will be interesting to see if we are starting to kind of open the aperture of in processes to kind of yield that that valuation hurdle. So it's it's not a sense of for again for high quality assets, uh, we're not seeing we're still seeing very robust multiples. In our processes on aggressive timelines, um, and and some buyers really leaning in and doing some kind of unnatural things, um, and and you know to to yield those those results, we are opening the aperture a little bit in terms of numbers of, of of buyers. I'll jump in on top of that. I I concur with you, but uh, we are not seeing any real trickle down yet either although i did mention in our last transaction which was a the larger raise for a private company the uh, pe fund that was an expert in the field knew the business great it would be a terrific uh partner with that company they did use the public comps as a tool as a weapon to downsize his valuation bid for this investment. And uh, like I said, the board of directors voted him down and they voted to go back out to market and, and keep the process. The process was only two days old and he came in early and we were excited about it, but then the valuation was low because he used public comps comparables showing the tech and some of these areas and other firms in this space had gotten hit in the stock market but on the and he was trying to use that utilize it to help in in his bid on a lower bid toward this privately owned company and the company and their board uh rejected it and they're going back it's like it never happened and go right to market again next week so we're starting to see some signs but it hasn't affected any of our deals yet. We just rejected it. <laughs> so that's it so far. Okay, thanks, Brad. And uh, back to Nadim, question from the audience as to what's accounting for the relative consistency in deal origination activity, if not the percentage of, of closing uh, of those deals. And they want to know: Is it is it boomers, boomer business owners looking to retire and exit, or what's what's uh, supporting the the deal flow out there? It's a really good question. Um, from a data side, I mean, two two factors come to mind. On the buy side, the private equity world is flush with capital. Uh, they need to deploy that capital. They can take a break for a little while. Um, but eventually they need to put those dollars to work. So there's a lot of demand to do deals. On the sell side, yes, I think it really depends on the circumstance. But uh, I can tell you, uh, I pointed out that last year was the first year that private equity outpaced corporate M&A um, and in terms of uh, total M&A volume. All those private equity holdings need to sell. 
you know, we, we publish this private equity harvest analysis and, and annually, and the last one that we did earlier this year showed that there were over 5,000 assets uh, that were acquired between 2013 to 2018 by private equity firms that hadn't traded yet. And if private equity deal volume is going to continue to increase, you know, all those are going to continue to sell. So, you know, it was it was fun listening to people's interpretation of the recession data that came out. Like, is this truly a recession? How can it be a recession when the job market is so strong? You know, it, it's like a mix. We live in a world of mixed results. And right now, I feel like that's what's happening in the private equity and M&A community. Like, quality assets are going to trade, and there's good reason for it because private equity buyers have money and they want to they want to do those deals, and there's opportunity. On the other hand, there's recession fears, there's other things. So uh, it really this is a really time to uh, you know to be a little thoughtful and strategic and 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 uh, place your bets. But but it's not a it's a very subjective. You know, depending on where you are and which sector you're playing in, what size deals you're doing, what your circumstances are, I think more now than ever are going to impact like what what the right strategy is for you. Okay, we've got uh, just about two or three minutes left, and with that time, I want to go around the uh, the virtual room one last time. Um, we'll start with Megan and. This is really to give your best advice to people on the line about what's working today in, in deal sourcing. What's, what's, what's proving to be the most fertile, uh, fertile strategies. And then Brad and Catherine, what we want to hear from you is it's in light of narrower auctions and the fact that it's just more difficult to get invites, to process these these days, what's your best advice to sponsors who who want to get on your radar and, and get into those uh, those auctions? So Megan, yeah, I think um, I think a couple of people mentioned this, but being back in person, I think matters. Um, I think you know you can do all the zooms and things like that, but I think just being back in person with people, people are more focused, ha having more in depth conversations, more things coming out of it. So um, I think there's a balance. I think I kind of went too far back to 2019 travel, but I think there's a good balance, but definitely, you know, city visits are really helpful. Um, like I mentioned, um, more sector focused um, dialogue, including the deal teams has been very fruitful. Um, trying to track assets, whether they're PE owned or founder owned is much in advance um, to try and get a leg up when getting into a process so that if, you know, you have more conviction, you can, you know, uh, potentially preempt or at least, uh, get in early a bit earlier than others because um, I think certainty to close in this market is a big deal and very, very um, highly valued uh, from what I'm hearing from investment bankers um, and then I think you know I was thinking about like boutiques versus the the bigger banks and I think it's it depends on the sector and depends on the the banker's perspective on whether they should go now or not so just really trying to keep a pulse um, with with everybody and what's coming out and what's not uh, but I think just I think Nadim mentioned kind of relooking, re-tiering. There's been a ton of movement in the market. Um, the, my team, we're, we're focused on where are people going, why. Um, I think there's a lot of boutiques that are doing more deals right now. So um, we're kind of focusing on data internally to kind of it, um, advise us of, of where we should be spending time. So those are, that's kind of my high level advice. Okay, good advice, Megan. Uh, Catherine? Yeah, I, I would agree with, with everything Megan just said. I, I think the, the most um, important thing in, in, in terms of what, what we're seeing um, people stand out in a process is having an angle and whether that's an operating partner, Megan, you said, or you know, you've, you've got in early with the company and you've developed a relationship way ahead of a formal process so that you know the management team, you know the, you know the owner, um, and often, and we're seeing this again, uh, even more so um, that our clients are are driving narrower narrower processes. They're the ones prioritizing potential buyers based on who has come inbound to them. Um, so I'd, I'd say, you know, best advice is just get out there and 
proactively develop relationships with with management teams and other sponsors you know sponsors that um are maybe uh you know if you're a middle market firm look look to uh you know lower middle market uh sponsors that and and, and get to know their portfolio companies and um i think just developing um relationships among your cohort of of other funds um that play in your sectors is, is an interesting um angle as well okay good advice and brad will give you the final word okay great um so i agree with what the panel just said and uh bottom line is it how can somebody get in on a process and show a differentiation and it's really about their, their knowledge and expertise that they have at their own team. Uh, operating partners do help also uh, when, when speaking about the company and very down deep dive into the company's um, you know, operations when speaking with a possible investor. The, the, also the speed at which people respond sometimes is, is a factor showing their high interest, you know, making sure the banker knows that you might be highly interested in this asset and why, how much time and effort uh, have you put into the pre-diligence or maybe even have you ever spoken to the company in the past? And I think all that can, can prove to be a valuable uh, differentiation when, when in a competitive market, it, it'll help you get in on the deal and also possibly win the the mandate. And also, you know, to Megan's point earlier on on how how effective in person um, and how powerful that can be impactful that that can be is, you know, if, if we're yeah. if we're reaching out as a as an advisor and kind of let, letting someone get an early look and, and their first response is, well, let's set up a, a Zoom meeting, we're probably going to move you down uh, a little bit further down the list so you know make if, if it's if it's a company that's uh that's that's really important and when you you want to get ahead and, and win play to win then you know go the extra go make the extra effort go ask for the in-person meetings and um so anyway. we, excuse me we, we noticed that too so a lot of times people have asked to be on a zoom with the company and do a informal hello and learn more but if there's not an immediate ask after that to go see the company in person we do we feel the same way it gives a bad signal to the banking firm we might not prioritize them as much as we had thought when their initial reaction was hey let's do a zoom if they're not willing to go see the company or meet, have the meet halfway or whatever actual meet with the company it's it's it, you know it might go against them a okay little. Yeah, it really speaks to the importance of, uh, of meeting in, in person. person and shaking hands. All right, I'm afraid we are out of time. And um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. I'd like to thank our sponsor, SPS by Bain Company, for making the webinar possible. I'd like to thank our speakers for doing a great job and all their hard work and preparation. Uh, Catherine Cesari of William Blair, making Knipe of Blue Point Capital, Brad McGowan of Pickwick. Capital Partners and Nadeem Malik of SBS by Bain and Company. Have a great Thank day, you. everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks.